Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to, um, to chat to you all tonight. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an absolute privilege to be able to talk through some of yeah, my journey in um, creating Climate Clever. Um, I thought I would really, really quickly, um, yeah, just very quickly go through my background um, and then explain. I, I know everyone's probably uh, knows diff varying levels of, of this whole thing. Can, can I just ask, does everyone know about like carbon accounting or, or um, carbon neutrality versus net zero? If you, a little bit? Yeah, okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll try and whiz through some of this stuff. Um, and then, yeah, just a little bit about the why, why we should be doing this, um, and then um, what we've tried to do with our Climate Clever app, and then at the end, I'll, I'll uh, do a demo as well, which is probably what most people are most interested in. All right, so um, just briefly about myself. Um, I've moved over, I moved over here from Melbourne back in 2009 to do my PhD at, at Curtin University. I was also managing a research, Australian Research Council, or ARC project called Decarbonising Cities and Regions. Um, my PhD was specifically on low carbon urban development and it was in the era that um, Brad Pettit here was um, a mayor of Fremantle and it was so exciting to see, um, you know, to really focus on w what we can do at that urban level in terms of decarbonising and there's so, there's so many opportunities. It's funny how quickly it's all changed as well because <laughs> 10 years ago we were talking about tri-generation as the next big decarb thing and now we're like, no, no gas. <laughs> gas is bad. But 10 years ago it was sort of seen as a transition fuel. Um, I then sort of um, fell into academia for a decade. Uh, I ended up um, uh, being a lecturer and a researcher at Curtin, um, Curtin University Sus Sustainability Policy Institute, or CUSP. Um, and I was also, yes, yeah, supervising lots of other PhD students in various topics around sustainability and um, climate change. Uh, and then in 2018, I founded Climate Clever. Um, but the inspiration actually came from uh, what, when I was doing my PhD back in 2012 and I helped to certify the first carbon neutral school in Australia. And that was sort of, yeah, provided the inspiration for where I've got to. Oh, shameless plug. Um, wrote a, the PhD got turned into a book <laughs> um, called Decarbonising Cities. But this really opened my, my eyes up into the opportunity within the built environment to reduce emissions. And again, back then, 10 years ago, we were talking about carbon abatement cost curves and um, and how you know there's there's so so many cost-effective carbon abatement opportunities within the built environment that actually save you money. So it's you know you get a return on your investment. Um, but just quickly around achieving net zero, um, just wanted to see if anyone wanted to throw up um, the the difference between carbon neutral and net zero. Does anyone want to have a stab? So is it the same thing? No, well, not really. I, I reckon. Uh, I don't know, but carbon neutral sounds like. Um that is absolutely correct and I have to say I was embarrassingly we were even on our website we were interchangeably saying oh you can go net zero or carbon neutral and but it's exactly that um, they the um, SBTI uh, what is it the uh, SBTI um, science-based targets. Science -based targets initiative um, they released their first report around um, net zero late last year and that's really set the definition for what net zero means and basically um, to become carbon neutral, um, you can you measure your emissions and you obviously always try and reduce as much as you can, but you can basically offset 100% of your emissions and become carbon neutral and that's okay. But to get to net zero, you can't offset more than 10% of your emissions. So you have to basically transition everything out of your um, carbon footprint um, and then only offset 10%. So that means, for example... Um, if you had a fleet of cars and they were petrol cars, you'd never be able to make net zero. You have to transition that to a 100% electric um, vehicle fleet, probably powered by renewable energy. Um, and that 10% is really those other sort of really unavoidable emissions. So that's the difference. And that's why we're saying net zero targets are sort of 2050 because they're going to, it's going to be a lot more expensive and harder to achieve um, in the short term. You know, it's going to be a transition because not, you know, these big companies aren't going to be able to transition straight away um, uh, to that. So, but, you know, carbon neutrality is definitely that stepping stone, but w I guess we all want to acknowledge that offsets are not going to, we're not going to be able to offset our way out of this climate crisis. Um, so, but just in terms of carbon neutrality and what that means, it's basically you've, you've, you've measured your emissions, um, you've reduced them as much as possible, and then you've offset the remaining ones to e equal your, net z your, your carbon neutral. Um, these are sort of the, the key steps. You start off, yeah, actually, like as I said, measuring. Um, ideally, you want to set targets once you've measured it because it's, it's hard to set targets before you've measured it because you don't actually know, what, you know what's going to be possible. Um, having said that, the, the SBTI, again, what was it again? Uh, yeah. The Science-Based Targets Initiative um, have got some really good guidelines around um, what you should do for your industry. 
uh, and then really looking at what you can do to reduce. And that's always, you know, especially at Climate Clever, that's a big focus, is like we want you to reduce your consumption um, and then uh, you can choose to offset if you want to do that as well. But the, big, the biggest thing is to reduce um, as much as possible. And then, of course, you want to disclose that. So report it and then disclose it. Share that. Um, you don't want to be going around saying, hey, we're carbon neutral, but you haven't really shown how you've done it because then that's where a lot of greenwashing has come from in the past and there's been you know, false and misleading claims that you, know, you might get fined um, for that as well. And then, of course, it's a repeat thing. Every year you have to do that because, as they say, you can't manage what you don't measure and it's an ongoing uh, measurement, especially to get to, our, to meet these targets. Um, so to start off with, you, you obviously pick a base year, which um, is, is proving really interesting right now because obviously we've just gone through COVID. So a lot of people who are, you know, just coming on this journey now go, OK, well, we'll just choose last year's, you know, as a base year or, or maybe 2021. But it is sort of mid-COVID and, and a lot of people are going, oh, do we really want to choose a base year that's so low because now emissions are obviously going to go up as we resume normal activities. Um, anyway, it's, it's all fine. So if you do, you just explain that's what's happened. Um, so you choose your base year um, and then you're collecting all the data. So utility bills, your, you know, your vehicles, uh, all the receipts for that. Uh, and then you're calculating your, your footprint. So that's the measure part. In terms of, yeah, very quick one-on-one on scopes of emissions, um, when we talk about carbon accounting, we talk about scope one, scope two, and scope three. Scope one are your direct emissions, so anything that's burnt or combusted um, or released sort of on site where you are. Um, so that includes, yeah, if you did have a vehicle and you're driving, you know, tailpipe emissions are coming out as you're moving, so that's the scope one. Uh, if you had a diesel generator on site, that's also a scope one emission. If you had a gas cooker in your home, that's, that's scope one. Uh, and also things like refrigerants, so things that are leaking out of your fridge or your air conditioning system, that's a gas that's coming straight into the atmosphere right now. So they're all your direct emissions, scope one. Scope two uh, is uh, emissions from electricity specifically, um, and it's an indirect emission because you're not you know, directly responsible for it, but indirectly you are because you've, you've drawn it from the grid. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, electricity also has scope three emissions as well because that's the transmission and distribution line losses that come from the power station or to where, to where it's been consumed. Um, and then scope three emissions are everything else under the sun. So there, there's often a, sort of a, some core uh, scope three emissions that are included, but it really could be as long as a piece of string in terms of what you include. And this is the, the, the thing that's getting some of the bigger emitters worried because they might have you know, thousands and thousands of suppliers that all form part of their scope three emissions because um, they're indirectly responsible for them. Um, so that, you know, scope three include, yeah, waste, flights, um, water, all sorts of um, things fall into that scope three category. And yeah? Like, in different industries, different gases Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And I have to say, I'm not an expert in other industries, and Larissa here is, <laughs> um, but for farming. But yeah, absolutely. Different industries produce, yeah, different types of emissions. Um, and then, yeah, basically, we have a whole bunch of different um, uh, reporting standards where you, you um, that have fr frameworks and reporting standards that have been in existence for a long time. So they have all the methodologies and the calculations sort of in there. Uh, and I'm, I guess I'm explaining this also because this is what's underpinning our app as well. Um, so you've got like the greenhouse gas um, protocol, um, which underpins sort of everything. Uh, and then you've, you've got ISO standards, you've got Climate Active have their own um, guidelines as well, which is sort of based on that. Uh, and then you've got the National Greenhouse Account Factor. So that's Australia, the, the government's um, document, which sort of says this is what the grid factor for WA is, this is what the grid factor for the uh, NEM is, and, and all the different ones. And they change every year. So they have a date and you have to go back in and change. If, you've, if you're using your own Excel spreadsheet, you have to go in every year and update them when these reports come out. So again, that's something that we do in the back end of our system is we're constantly updating all these different emission factors and there's lots of local ones as well that you find. Um, and then you basically get your um, activity data, so your utility bill, so your electricity. So if you've got your uh, electricity bill, you get the kilowatt hours um, or yeah, vehicle receipts or, or kilometres travelled, flights, and then we times that by the, uh, the emission uh, factor. Um, yep, setting targets, I've sort of touched on that already, so just making sure that you choose some ambitious ones um, that are going to help us meet our actual targets. Um, and then, yeah, looking at the emission reduction opportunities, uh, you know, I'm a big fan, and a <laughs> few of us are here, about energy efficiency is one of the, you know, the biggest things you can do. It's a cost savings. Um, but there's all sorts of things that, you know, and depending on your, on your industry, um, so many different things that you can do to, to reduce, um, which is our focus. Um, and... Yeah, just, just going back to, um, I, you know how I said I, um, we started 
I started this journey because I helped to certify the first carbon neutral school in Australia. That journey led on into creating sort of a program for schools and um, we did a two year program with the city of Frio um, and, and some other um, councils and other schools in other areas as well. We had 15 schools and we identified, um, I think it was over 600 initiatives that those schools were doing. All of them were, oh no, I think 70% of them were no cost or like behavior change type of emissions, uh, sorry, initiatives. Um, things from like getting rid of you know, uh, fridges, turning off chilled water fountains in winter when you don't want to freeze your teeth, um, you know, all sorts of little things. Um, so that's just to sort of explain just, you know, how much you can do without even having a budget if you don't have a budget. Um, and then, of course, yeah, purchasing offsets. And this was a big thing 10 years ago, again, around greenwashing. And there was a, there was a few things that popped up around reselling the same offsets and, um, and, you know, finding credible ones. It's actually popped up again now, hasn't it? Like, just how dodgy the whole system is. Um, so... There, I think the federal government's... Actually, there's definitely people here that know more about this. They're going through a review at the moment, aren't they, of the ERF, the Emission Reduction Fund, and, you know, checking out how we're developing these. Um, these are our units, Australian Carbon Credit Units, um, but there's also a lot of international um, carbon offsets you can purchase that are all done by the international standards as well. Previously, these were really cheap to buy. Um, the city of Frio used to... has is still carbon neutral, um, and they've been purchasing um, offsets, you know, for, for 10 years or more, and I think... You, I don't know if we're allowed to disclose this, but in the early days it was, you know, dollars, and now it's, you know, t more, multiple <laughs> dollars per ton. Uh, it's, got, it's, it's risen ridiculously in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, offsets are going crazy. Um, and, and then, as I said, be transparent, so making sure that you publish that. So you, you don't want to be um, done for false and misleading claims. You want to, you know, some people might say, oh, we're carbon neutral, but they've only really calculated their energy emissions. And you're like, well, but what about your, you know, water and waste and the other these things? So this is why you really need to say, this is our report, this is what we've included, and this is how we've done it. And then, as I mentioned, repeat that every year. Just really quickly, policies and regulations, they're all coming. We know they're all coming, um, particularly from, um, well, we all heard the, the new government. That, and it actually, and again, more knowledgeable people in the room than I, um, are these targets scope one and two, or do, in, do they include three as well? Do you know? I thought scope one and two. Scope one and two, okay. <laughs> is that what you're going to say? Yeah, it's only scope one and two. Scope one and two. Actually, the thing I meant to point out the big chunk is that coal emissions. Yeah. There's not much else in that pie. No, that's right. Yeah. Do you say other coal emissions? Yeah. But what else does the state government do? Like they run some offices, they've got a big cycle, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it won't move the, the, the meal that much. Yeah. It's just providing leadership. Yeah, exactly. It's providing leadership, yeah. So, um, but I was going to say, it can trickle down. Probably in this case it doesn't if they're not including scope three. If they were including scope three in the future, that trickles down to every single business that supplies to the, local, to the state government. Um, and that's, you know, I guess something we work with local governments and that's something we'll be pushing local governments as well is to say, hey, why don't you actually check who you're buying from and see if you can put some measures in place to say we want to know what your carbon emissions are as well if you're going to supply to us. Um, Europe's probably leading the way. Um, just heard from Brad that Germany's kind of undoing some stuff <laughs> at the moment, which I didn't know about. <laughs> um, but the EU Green Deal has been really pushing this um, and, you know, they've been really um, good at, you know, understanding that globally we don't have, you know, emissions trading schemes or carbon taxes everywhere. So they've been really trying to push this, um, like, carbon border adjustment taxes to say, if you're in a country like Australia, historically, that haven't had um, an emission trading scheme or anything, then you'll be, you'll be taxed on your way into a, into a country that has this. So, yeah, yeah. Couldn't the West Australian government ban fossil fuel vehicles within a five-kilometre radius of the city? Um, that's a bread question. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I stole it from somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it was interesting. Just on that. Thank you. Just on that. Um, oh, no, I definitely didn't make it myself. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think I stole it off the EU website. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, on the hydrogen thing, though, I, I was living in Berlin in 2006, 2007, and I actually ended up doing an internship at the Berliner Verkehrsbetrieb, which is the Berliner train company, um, and they, or, or public transport company, and they were doing a, um, a trial of hydrogen fuel buses, and it was um, Berlin, Perth, and I think Rio de Janeiro or something. And do you remember that? This yeah, was back... Bus, yeah, yeah 2000... Used to catch the metal community back in the... Yeah. In the anyway, and it was... Well, but this is this is how you know technologies sort of go through these. Because back then, I remember going, "Oh, this is so exciting!" But yeah, it, oh, it took way too much energy to produce, and it just didn't seem um, viable at the time. But now it's sort of come full swing again, and it's now it's really, yeah, taking off again, which is great. Yeah, economics exactly, and yeah, and carbon pricing and everything. Um, so yeah, I've probably gone way too long. Um, Don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> Haven't even got to the fun part yet. Um, uh, oh, thanks, Keith. Um, so, yeah, this is just to say that there is going to be a growing um, focus on, on scope three emissions, and which is going to impact all of us, anyone who's, who's running a business. Um, we're all going to be responsible at some point in the value chain for measuring and, you know, getting ahead of it is, is definitely a risk um, of, of, you know, you can start to mitigate those risks. Okay, Climate Clever, our app. Um, just really quickly, this is, um, yeah, my journey. So, as I said, I, I um, f helped us to helped to certify the first carbon neutral school in Australia back in 2012. Um, that was South Fremantle Senior High School. Um, it, we celebrated with a Prime Minister at the time, Julie Gillard. It was a great achievement. Um, and then uh, I tried to sort of basically scale what we did with that one school. Took many, many years to even get some funding. Um, so uh, it, was, it was 2016, 17 that we launched our first pilot with Excel spreadsheets and Google Docs. Um, and then that was quite successful. And then uh, after that, we, we got our first little bit of funding to launch the first version of the app, which was quite clever. So that was in 2018. Um, we then, in 2019, got some initial impact investment, which enabled me to leave the university, jump into the startup full time. Um, and we also won a big Lottery West grant to create a home version of the Climate Clever platform, which was up until then just for schools. Um, that worked really well because then in 2020, um, COVID hit and everyone uh, was locked in their houses. Uh, it was just after those horrific bushfires. So climate change for two seconds was front of mind. Um, and, but then obviously utility bills are rising and everything. So it was um, you know, a good opportunity to say, hey, house, hey, homes, you can actually do something in your home to reduce your carbon footprint, but also save money uh, as well. Um, we also launched a local government partnership program in 2019 um, as we started to see a lot of uh, as we didn't see gov uh, action at the federal level, a uh, little varying action at the state level, local governments all over Australia were declaring climate emergency and really trying to push forward and, uh, and take action. But what they didn't have was the ability to target the community. They, they often were doing their own emissions, um, the council operations and facilities, um, but they wanted to set, similar to like what Fremantle did years and years ago, they wanted to set, set some community targets and goals and they didn't have a way of measuring it. So that was what we could um, sort of provide them. We could say, well, here's, some, here's a way to measure your home emissions and your school emissions. And then um, last year, we sort of soft launched a business version of the app, which again was very tailored for SMEs, small to, business, small to medium businesses. And that was sort of the gap in the market where we saw um, you know, bigger businesses have bigger budgets and higher consultants, but the smaller businesses don't have that luxury. And so they sort of needed a, a, a platform similar to like schools that they could just sort of plug in some data and, and get going and do stuff. We're now sort of launching some bigger partnerships with um, and bigger businesses and looking at supply chains. And um, we're also looking to open up our API so people can just embed our, our, our app into their own app as well. Um, um, probably in a couple months or toward, yeah, mid to late this year. Yeah. Can you, answer, can you just repeat the question so that the people who are online can hear them? Sure. That, that question was, um, what was the timeline for the API? And I was just saying maybe mid to late this year. Um, so this is what we were trying to disrupt as, as a, a tech, you know, climate tech, te um, climate tech uh, startup. Um, the traditional approach to calculating carbon emissions and helping them to reduce is, is usually is using consultants, which I just mentioned, um, and that is too, yeah often too expensive for, for smaller businesses. The other option are, are often there's free calculators online, but they're also um, based on lots of assumptions and not really that accurate, and you can't and maybe not as credible. So you can't really base you know you don't want to hang your whole credibility on on this sort of free um, calculator, uh, and you don't really see all the underpinning assumptions as well that they've based it on. Um, and then you can try and do it yourself as well, which uh, I think a lot of people who've tried that sort of quickly get to a point where it's very complicated and, and too hard. 
Um, so that's where we've come in. We've tried to we've we've uh, digitalized it, made it online. Um, we've tried to create make it as affordable as possible. In fact, in February this year, we we actually made it free. Um, and, and then there's some paid tiers as well, but anyone can get started across the home, schools or businesses for free now. Um, it's, which, I mean, the great thing is we've created it for kids initially, so it's really simple <laughs> and easy to use for even those non-tech adults. Um, but it's, it's very accurate as well. Like I've you know, c come from the university, it's all based on, on the science and, um, and on all the carbon accounting documents that I showed you. Uh, it's designed to be engaging and, and very data driven as well. Like we're, we're really excited about sort of all the data that we can aggregate for our partners as well. Um, and it sort of helps to build community as well, knowing that we're all on this journey together and we're starting to build in a bit more um, of that sort of gamification and being able to compare with others as well. Um, so th this is sort of the way um, the, the app works. You, you, there's a measure section where you enter all your data. Um, then you can choose from a whole bunch of uh, actions in our library. Um, that you actually start to project manage in the app, and um, then you can offset, you can choose to do that, you don't have to do that, but um, I think we'll be releasing this hopefully next, next week actually, um, the ability to, um, so you can purchase offsets through our app, but we definitely don't want to be seen as an offsetting app, so if you wanted to choose offset, offsets from somewhere else, you can certainly do that as well, and just upload your report to our platform, um, and then you can also um, download an automated, uh, uh, automated um, report which just pulls all the data that you've entered into the app and it will generate a beautiful um, report that you can then put on your website to say, hey, this is our carbon status. You know, if, you do, if you're not carbon neutral, that's just as valid to say this is where we are and this is our reduction um, journey. Um, and you can track it, you know, throughout the, the year as well in the app. And that's another benefit um, from sort of the consultant approach, which is often a paper report that lands on your desk once a year and you sort of revisit 12 months later. The, the whole point of this is that you can actually go in you know, every month or quarterly and sort of go, oh, this is how, you know, these actions are tracking and this is how we're going. Um, and, yeah, so as I mentioned, we're, we're trying to, uh, we're looking for some bigger businesses to pilot this with, but we're trying to make it easier to, to measure those supply chain emissions now as well. So if a bigger business was looking to look at, wanting to look at their scope three emissions, we basically work with them, we send them a link, they send it out to their thousands of suppliers, those suppliers sign up with the platform, enter their details, and then we can aggregate all that up and provide it back to that one supplier. So what previously was kind of unfeasible for them to do. They just, you know, could you imagine cut, pulling together 7,000 Excel spreadsheets? Um, that's why they just didn't do it. Um, so that's what we're trying to, trying to do now. Oh, and so that's the end. Um, you can read. <laughs> um, take action. <laughs> Any, anything, you know, just getting started and measuring. And, that, and that's the wonderful thing, what, what Max has sort of said about this group, is that people just, you know, they want to do something. So um, this is a, a very simple way to get started to, you know, actually measure your, your emissions. Um, obviously, it can help reduce your costs, increase your um, productivity, and hopefully, if you do have a business, you know, it can um, help with that competitive advantage as well. Uh, also, yeah, um, helps you get prepared for future legislation. Um, and oh, this is, I guess this is the thing that I get very excited about, the bigger businesses. They can actually, they can influence their supply chains, and that's where we're going to see probably the action happening, is if they say, you know what, we'd like you to measure this, because all the clients that are supplying to BHP or whatever, all of a sudden they'd be like, oh, oh, if, if BHP doesn't do it, we want to keep winning that tender, so we better go off and, and measure and do what they say. So we're hoping that there'll be some of those bigger businesses that do start going down this process. All right, so that's that. And now I'll jump into a quick demo. But while I'm doing that, is there, are there any questions? Question about um, data ownership. So I want to Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the, the person who's entering the data? Sorry, oh. I'm going to run around oh, the yeah. for questions, but maybe if you could just... Repeat that one? Okay. Okay. Um, the question was, yeah, who owns the data? So if someone's entering data in the platform, then that's shared to a, a bigger client or a local government. Who, who owns that data ultimately? Um, absolutely the person who entered that data uh, owns that data. So if you ever wanted to leave the platform and you say delete my data, um, it will be deleted. Um, although, having said that, we, we do actually have to um, store it for seven years for accountability, but we won't share private data or anything. So. Um, and when we do share data, it's always de-identified if it's, you know, if it's aggregated for a local government, for example, and we'll always ask explicit permission if we do, like, in that instance where a bigger client wants to see what their suppliers are, they will be, the supplier will be asked, um, are you okay to share your identifiable information with this supplier? Because I think in many cases, the, the bigger company will want to see, you know, that's part of what they want to see is who, who is actually, who's that company, yeah. Have I discussed it? 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, not specifically on this. I, uh, we, work, we were colleagues at Curtin at CUSP, um, so we've had lots of conversations in the past, but not specifically. Okay, I'll, I'll certainly look them up then. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes. Sorry, is there an online question? Oh, yes, please. Uh, just, is the app also set up for individuals, homeowners, and renters to measure? Yes, that was a very good question. I, I, I think I very quickly skipped over that. Um, oh, that's looking funny. If you zoom in your browser, it might work. Okay. Uh, can you come and do tech? <laughs> Thanks, Max. <laughs> um, yes, so the, the home app is now free for anyone. So you can jump on the website tonight and um, sign up for free for the homes. Um, and you can um, start entering your, your household data. Um, and you can also sign up for free as a school or a business. Um, if you want to report, that sort of ticks you over to a paid tier and it starts at $500. So again, that's very cheap for a, a carbon report that if you're going to a consultant, it's probably going to be two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 for something, for, you know, for a smaller business. It can go much higher for, for bigger businesses. Thank you, Max. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, was there any other questions online, peeps? That was it? No. Okay. Any other questions in the room? I could ask one. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned some of the regulations and, uh, and what's happening in Europe and stuff like that. Is there any sort of plans to harmonise between Europe and Australia? Or, you know, we've always seen to be, you know, waiting to see what other people do. And, you know, um, you mentioned that Europe were kind of advanced with all this stuff. But is Australia up with them? Well, up until recently, <laughs> um, I don't think we had any plans whatsoever. Um, with this new government, I suspect there's probably a lot of plans um, on the cards, but I feel like I'm probably not the best person to talk about it, and there might be others in the room, but do, do you, would you, Larissa or Brad, would you? It's very early days. I don't yeah. Knows yet. Yeah. 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 We could be leading. Yeah. We could be. I went through and one thing which I learned uh, just reading a book last week, which is that when there was a carbon price way back, yeah. Um, the the plan was that that would come in and be synchronised with the European yes. trading system. Yeah. It was really interesting. interesting. So that's like a step towards. A, a I remember researching that in my PhD back yeah, then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's been. I have to say, when I after I finished my PhD and was lecturing in climate policy, every year I had to change my sides because every year we had a new climate policy. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody um, Anyway. Um, oh, okay. So, oh yeah, I'll just quickly show you. So once you log into our app, um, up here you can see uh, it says dashboard, measure, action, track. So they're the, sort of the key tasks. Um, I also will say we're going through a big review as well at the moment, so it's going to change quite a bit um, in the layout over the next couple of months, particularly as we add more emission sources into it. Um, but, yeah, this is the dashboard when you land on it. Um, so at the moment we're under the carbon tab, so it will show you what your carbon footprint... Um, this is after you've ad added some data. It will say this is what your carbon footprint is right now, and this is how it was at the same time last year. Um, so it's saying that you're, right now you're 80% or 79% better compared to last year. Um, if you've got abatements there, things like if you've um, put your flight emissions into the app, and, but you've also ticked the box to say I've actually already offset my flight at point of purchase, then it will, um, the, the whole emission will be there and then the, the abatement will be there, captured there. Same with green power, like if you purchase elect um, green electricity, the whole electricity will be there, but then it will say, but you've actually already reduced it, and this will be your net footprint, um, and that will be compared as well. Um, then there's a, a quick little pie chart about the breakdown of your emission sources. Um, and then if you go into costs, it sort of does a, a similar little um, chart. It will say where you're saving the most at the moment. Um, it's always interesting to, to look at the difference between the carbon, the cost, and the usage, because they never really tell the same story. Like the, and this is what I always say, like your, your usage might stay exactly the same, but your carbon emissions might go down because there's more renewable in energy in the grid one year than the next, um, and your costs might go up even though your consumption's gone down just because of the change in electricity pricing. So it's always good to sort of see the different views. Um, yeah, and then you can see um, your usage. That doesn't look like it's reflecting right. Anyway, um, so in the measure section... Um, at the moment, we have electricity, gas, LPG, water waste, vehicles, air travel, and paper. Um, as I mentioned, we're just in the process of adding a whole bunch more of other emission sources into it. Um, in the back end, we've done all the complexity around what's scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Um, 
And then, uh, yeah, in terms of um, when you go to, we're sitting in electricity at the moment. Um, so when you start there, you, you add an account to start with. So we've, we've got the three dummy accounts just that we've added here. Um, if I just go to add a new account. Um, so you just put the account name, you select which utility provider it is. Um, what we're trying to do at the moment is automate as much of this as possible for, um, from the utility provider perspective. Um, so if you clicked on Synergy, um, you can also say the percentage of green power if you've got it, um, or if you've got solar panels. Um, but once you've added it, um, this, is, this message will come up if you're with Synergy. So the, the, first, um, the first utility provider that we've automated is, is the Synergy. So you can basically log into your Synergy account through our app, and then our app will save and encrypt your password and login details, and then our app will just periodically, like once a month, whatever, pop into Synergy's website, see if there's any new bills, draw the data out and put it straight in here for you so you don't actually have to do the manual data entry. So we're going to try and do that across all utility providers in Australia, which is going to be a fun job. <laughs> um, uh, and then, yeah, basically, but if you don't want to do that and you just want to add them, you can either upload a CSV. So in the Synergy, if you've got your online account, you can download a CSV um, and then you can upload it into ours. You just have to format it um, the way that we ask you to there. Um, and then you can just upload, you know, two years' worth of data or, or three years as much uh, at one point, at one time. If you want to add a bill manual, if you've just got your, your bills in front of you, you can just add the date of the bill, total consumption and total cost, and that's all we, and if you've got solar, um, that's all we need. And then that's um, the data that would then convert into your carbon footprint. Similar um, process for gas and water. LPG is, is just adding, um, like, one, bottles of gas, like if you have a gas um, barbecue or something, um, you can add that. Um, waste uh, is a bit different. So when you go to add a waste bill, um, uh, you add the date of the bill. Again, this is, this is probably more, at the moment, it's more for um, businesses or schools. Um, we haven't added this, the waste for homes because if anyone knows anything about local governments, they're all different and they all have different bins and different sizes. And um, so we're just sort of in the process of trying to um, pull that together for the app. But if, if you're a business or a school and you have like a, a waste provider that picks up your bins, um, so you can select, you put in the date of the bill, um, you select the stream. So we've got lots of different streams there. Um, we actually only measure the emissions associated with general waste, which is the, the standard practice, um, but we're capturing the, the weight of these ones as well. So we can, down the track, we can say this is how much has been diverted from landfill. Um, so you select uh, what it is, put in the cost. Um, the way you do carbon, what, the way we calculate carbon emissions from waste is you need the weight data, but often the waste companies won't provide you with that. Um, it's not necessarily in their best interest for you to know um, if your bin is full or empty because they like to flip it anyway. Um, so if you don't have the weight, then we just ask for the, um, the bin size, um, so the, or the volume, um, and the, yeah, what am I saying? So is it a wheelie bin or a skip bin, and then the volume of it, and how many, and uh, how full was it? And then you can add more streams um, for that one bill if you had them. So that's waste. Vehicles. Um, so we use the green vehicle guide. You go to add a vehicle. Um, I think you can also upload into CSV for this one. Yep. If you, so if you're a business and you had a fleet of vehicles, you can just upload a CSV. Um, but if you're just doing like a one-off, especially if you're doing it for your home, um, you add a vehicle. Um, so you just go through all these drop-downs. Oh, yeah, let's, let's do a Cadillac. And then, you know, it'll go, <laughs> it'll go through. You just um, answer all the things till you find the specific make and model. Um, and the green vehicle guide knows the exact fuel efficiency of all the cars. Um, so once you've added it, um, then you just log the distance. Um, so, you, I mean, you can do it for the whole year. You can say 1st of January to the 31st of December, I travel this many kilometres, and then uh, it knows, um, uh, it'll calculate the uh, carbon for that. Um, air travel, again, if it was a business and you had like hundreds of flights, you can upload a CSV. Otherwise, um, if you're just adding one or two, you can just um, add that manually as well. So um, you need to choose what, business, what class of um, you've flown that affects your carbon footprint. Just remember that if you're flying business class, you'll, you've got a bigger footprint. Um, and then if you've offset it at point of purchase, so that, that's where we will actually um, take that off as an abatement. Um, and then your origin and destination. Um, and then paper, hopefully no one uses paper anymore. So this hopefully is, is uh, defunct. But um, anyway, you can um, put in how, how many reams of paper you've purchased um, and if, whether it's imported, recycled or carbon neutral. This goes back to Max's point when you're in a supermarket and there's so many options and does your head in. But they all have, everything has a carbon impact, uh, every decision you make. So that's how we enter the data. Um, actions. Uh, so when you um, go to, uh, sorry, just to take a step back, when we're working with schools, what we were really finding is that they really didn't know where to start. They're like, we've got a worm farm. Should we do a lighting up, LED lighting upgrade? And 
Um, that was when we'd be like, oh, you know, your, your worm farm cost $150. Your LED lighting upgrade might be $150,000 across the whole school. Let's, let's have a think about what other actions you can do that are either no cost or low cost and then save some money, hopefully, and then you can uh, invest in other uh, actions. Of course, again, under the manual, if you had a consultant, they'd come in and do a very detailed um, energy audit for you, and that, that'd be fantastic. But if you don't have that, what we've tried to do here is provide that strategic process um, broken down a bit. So we basically say, what do you want to start off with? Do you want to start with the no-cost actions or low-cost or medium-cost? Um, always obviously suggesting no-cost. Um, what our app has done is it's found all the um, actions that are under electricity and what um, you know, 12 under water, 11 under waste. Um, and then you can uh, click on that. And then it, you can just sort of scroll through all these different actions that you can do. So these are no-cost actions. Um, and then when you... Um, go to accept one and just ask you, you know, a due date for that action and, and assign it to someone because we were trying to make this like a process that helps you keep you accountable as well and sends you reminders of, hey, your action's coming up and it's due. So once you add an action, it will land in the not started column. So anyone's used Asana or Trello, sort of your typical project management board, you can just um, move the actions from not started to in progress. Um, and when you move it into completed, it just asks for a quick completion report. That's just to help us understand how these actions are going, you know, and we just ask them, you know, how easy was it to implement? Would you recommend it? How much did it cost? Um, did you have a supplier? Would you recommend them? Um, and that's just uh, feedback so we can either get rid of that action if everyone's like, uh, it was a horrible action. Um, or, you know, if someone created a new action from scratch, that also provides us with the information to say, hey, that was a good action. We'll leave that in there. So we're trying to kind of create that citizen science approach as well, like everyone can sort of contribute to the actions going forward. It means we don't have to, as Climate Clever, don't have to be across all the new latest technology because... Other people will, will um, do that for us. So that's the actions. Uh, and that's, the, and that, that's how we give that information back to local governments as well. We can say, oh, you've got this many households and this many businesses, and they've identified this many actions, and they've implemented that many actions, et cetera. And then in the track, track section, um, so you could look at your overall um, you know, emission bubbles. Um, so flight's obviously a really big one, electricity. Uh, if you click on one of them, like electricity, you can then look at it at a yearly or a monthly view. So if you wanted to look at monthly, you can see how you're tracking this month compared to the same month last year, hopefully improving. You can also look at a, an, a cost level or the usage level. And this is what I was sort of saying before. It's really interesting to see all three charts in a row. Um, I think your yeah, usage is having a little glitch. Um, so you can see different stories. And you can also look at the growth or the net footprint there as well. Um, and then... Uh, if you're looking at it the yearly, you can also compare with others, especially at the home level, you can compare with others. Businesses, I think, um, we're still, you know, we need enough businesses in the, that are similar to sort of be able to compare them. But at the home level, you know, we take into account if you, you're, you know, a, a big mansion or a tiny apartment and how many bedrooms you have and stuff. Um, and then you can also compare um, on a per, for the whole business or per staff member, or the same at the household level, you can say um, a whole house or per person. Um, we did that as well because like, during our pilot with the um, schools, we had a school that doubled in size over the two-year program. So we're like, oh, man, you're going to like screw up all of our you know, great reduction stats because obviously your footprint's going to increase because you've got all these demountables and everything on site. Um, but then you could look at it on a per-student basis and it might still actually go down, which is because you know, they've put all these fancy um, new energy efficiency things in. So that's basically how it works. Um, what's coming in the next week is the ability to purchase your offsets through there and then generate your report. Um, and I'll just really quickly show you um, what the report looks like um, that, that will be generated, if I have time, if I may. Yeah, no. I was going to say that. Oh. We have one more question online. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. You finish up. Well, you... Uh, yeah. One online question, and then uh, we'll move it into the... Definitely. Yeah, do you want to read the question? Oh, sorry. Can you read the question for me, Keith? Or, oh, so sorry. Or does someone want to speak it out? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just going to do that. I just have to remember to turn up the microphone, otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, just the question was, what is the cost to the household? Um, oh, the, the, the cost yeah. of the app? Of the app it's, to a household, renter, homeowner. It's free. It used to be $30 a year, and now it's free. We don't have free, any charge. Free, free, free. Free is in free beer? <laughs> we pay you to reduce your emissions. No, no, we don't. <laughs> um, oh, OK, I was hoping to show you a more glamorous version of this, um, and I don't think I have it. So I'm going to show you this one instead. Uh, I think you guys can see, can't you? But I'll just quickly share my screen with the onliners. Uh, yeah. So this is what will um, sort of be 
um, spat out automatically if you choose to have the report. Um, it'll give you the opportunity to write your own little blurb about your business, um, and then um, there'll be a section on why we're taking action on climate change, uh, and then there'll be a section for you to um, enter, write in your own information about what your own goals and targets are for your organisation or school. Um, there'll be a section on terminology where we describe it all, and then it'll go straight into all the stats. So it will show you, you know, what um, emissions are included in your report, what your total footprint is, um, if there's any um, emissions excluded, we ask you to explain why they're excluded. Um, it will show you a little pie chart of, of your um, uh, the, yeah, the emissions uh, percentage and by scope. Um, and then um, we have to go through and actually talk about how much usage you've got, um, what your abatements are, uh, and then uh, reductions. Uh, and, then, and then it will show you what your you know, percentage up and down are compared to your previous year. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, number of actions in this period, and then it will show, it will list all, so based on the action plan you saw, it will just list all those actions that you've, you've actually done in that reporting period. Um, it will say if there's a change in your footprint, which there probably will be, either up or down, we just ask you to explain that as well, you know, and say, yeah, it was prob primarily from our new solar panels, or, or we increased our staff size and they all flew to America. Um, then you can upload your offset certificate, which will be displayed in there as well. Uh, and then it will just um, yeah, say this is what your net footprint is after that and then whatever status you are, carbon neutral or, or climate clever business. Um, and, yeah, and, and then we um, document all the methodology. We're trying to be as transparent as we can with all of this, so to really just say this is how it's all being calculated and then there will be more information on the, the website under methodology. But I will leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you.